now we have Ruth Marty Kondakar, and uh, we thought she was going to be in uh, what New Delhi. Uh, we were wrong. She's in New York. That's far away too. Welcome to the show, Ruth Marty. It's nice to see you. Hello, Haji, and another opportunity to speak with you, and very cherished one. In that. So uh, yeah, let's let's uh, sort of get a handle on what you're doing these days. Um, you were with the United Nations in New York. Yes. And you've written a book on reforming the United Nations. How does yes. the United Nations feel about your book? Uh, it's, it's a part of their process, isn't it? It's long overdue for the United Nations to be reformed. It's still in the structure and infrastructure of the 1945 uh, agreement by which the countries came together. It needs to represent the dynamics of the international society, contemporary uh, politics. So it's still not representative of that. So yes, the reform oh yes. is I'm, I'm, I compliment you in writing a book about Thank this because so it's, uh, it, you know, it, it should have happened before. Somebody should have written a book about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, so, uh, and the last time we spoke, we spoke about uh, the hills. He wrote a book about uh, In the Hills, Dragon in the yes. Hills, I think it was. And that was about, um, you know, the, the, the fight, uh, the physical fight of the Indian uh, military and the Chinese military um, up on the hills above northern India, uh, which is actually not resolved, is it? No, it, 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 it's, a, it's a undefined border, which will, uh, which will never see agreement because it's absolutely underdeveloped. It's in adverse uh, climatic conditions where you have snow and the Himalayan terrain. How can you guard such a post, uh, any country? And two countries who are who have previously been in war uh, territory. So for them, it's a more difficult um, situation due to the present underlying animosity in between them. So there is an underlying tension due to the um, non-definition of the borders. And as we discussed in our previous program, um, uh, the late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru left it undefined. So it was a basic tenant of uh, state sovereignty, which he left, that he left the borders undefined. And because of that, India still continues to su suffer because of uh, the, um, the uncertainty in that area. And you're still active? You were the director of a Global Relations Forum. Is that still active? Is that part yes. of your presence at the United Nations? Uh, it's it's more working with the European Union Smart Cities uh, uh, project that they are uh, uh, indulging in. So we work, we research about the smart, uh, cities of uh, India which need to bring in these smart cities uh, uh, programs by sponsored by the EU. And it's a collaboration between India and EU. So smart cities uh, in meaning which we, they get in renewable sources of energy, you have better infrastructure, all that will come in um, to India. So that's a very progressive uh, initiative of the European Union delegation to India. Well, you know, just touching those points with you, it's clear that, um, you know, you, you fit within the model of thinker uh, that understands we have gone long past Thomas Friedman now. It's not that the world is flat but the world is completely together, like it or not. We are in interdependent, like it or not. And, and that takes us um, you know, to uh, COP26, doesn't it? Because yes. unless we act together, we will all regret it. It will affect all of us, every single one. So Mr. Modi went there and he shook everybody up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. he, you know, everyone <laughs> he knows what he said. And the question is uh, whether it's rhetoric, rhetoric or real. Uh, he said that by 2030, uh, you would be off, um, you would, or you would cut um, fossil fuel use in half or emissions in half. By 2070, you'd be down to net zero. Now that's pretty ambitious. Can you talk about it? Yeah. Now it was a shocker for the world, isn't it, to, for India to come and take the global stage by storm in the COPs 26. We didn't expect him to come and talk about this, but you see, there is a lot of practicality in what he speaks. He gave a 10-year later deadline than most countries would say. He could have easily said it's 2035, we will be net zero emissions, but he set a practical pathway that it's 2070. It's a long way across, but he set it. 
So the practicality of this man to lay down a, a plan is commendable. And India is the only country which in print and media has delivered its promise in the Paris Agreement. So we can take his word for that. And if you see, there are two initiatives that he took in for these, uh, uh, these promises that he made. He has spoken about the Indian Railway cutting down its emissions by 60 uh, million uh, tons a year. And he's talking of the LED bulb, which is cutting down emissions by 40 million tons a year. So that makes 100, 100 million tons. So that is, a, that is what he's talking about, that he is doing the work. So it's not just the hollow promises that uh, leaders bring in. He is delivering on his promises. So we, um, in India, we know that this initiative is very, uh, he starts it in small ways. You know, Jay, I'll tell you one thing, that he has started a campaign in India on December 3rd last year. He said that develop one city, one smart city in every state of India which is the, either the state capital or the tourist city. So it serves as a role model for other cities to see that how they are using renewable energy. So that display and that, um, that allure of uh, seeing that a city functions by renewable sources is the way he functions in India. And to make a billion people follow you, you need this kind of advertisement. So he is starting, he is contributing by making a billion people follow the guidelines of, clim uh, of uh, mitigating climate change. So well, you, you suggest climate. that maybe this will be painful in some way uh, to the people of India. And for example, a couple of things. One is that right now, India, of all the major nations in the world, and clearly India is a major nation um, in terms of population and productivity and all that. India uses less energy per capita than uh, the US by far, uh, less than China, uh, less than all the other major nations. It's, it's down to a pretty small amount. And so if you wanted to um, cut you know, uh, fossil fuel down on a, the tons of, of carbon down on a, on a per capita basis, which is what he's talking about, um, the per capita basis is not that much relative to these other countries. They have a greater burden uh, per capita. But the other thing I, I just wanted to mention is that India does not have, India has some solar up in the, I guess the Northeast somewhere um, in, a, in a desert there. I forget the name of the desert is something like, uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, big desert. And it has a huge uh, solar facility. Um, it does not have a lot of other resources um, uh, and um, it, it is dependent on coal. Uh, and, and in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was only a year ago that Mr. Modi was uh, expanding coal operations. He was uh, selling uh, national leases to coal producers. He was drawing mm -hmm. investment, which he was unsuccessful in actually achieving the investment he wanted. Um, but he was drawing investment for the development of coal. Now it's one year later, and he's talking about cutting coal. Am I missing something? No, that's right. They have all switched to the sustainable uh, finance, uh, isn't it? They're not going to uh, finance any more coal projects henceforth. Now, the dependence of coal in India is mainly because the railway system in India is massive, Jay. Massive. I mean, the entire population travels through rails, and we had a coal-based railway system. Electricity was provided through coal. Now, India is uh, blessed with uh, solar energy. Like the entire in, uh, part, uh, nation of India, it falls in the solar belt where we receive the solar energy for most part of the year. So this is what the Solar Alliance that he has initiated and uh, taken leadership is in uh, indulging in. So to cut the dependence of coal, it took a long time to change the infrastructure. We have automobiles, we, have, we don't have electric cars. Now, now the companies that are coming in, the cartels that are, that are dissolved, that you cannot do this any further. They have set their dates that this can happen 
we ha- we need electric cars we need uh, cities which are uh, dependent on uh, renewable sources these are guidelines which are given by the government uh, in such a way that they have to follow it it's not possible for them to now take a route and uh, still depend on coal well that's good on a couple of levels one you know one is i mentioned that india that didn't have um, you know uh, other um, uh, other so, energy so. resources like like oil there's no mm-hmm. oil in india huge country huge population but no oil which means that india is uh, you know at 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 risk to the oil markets in the world yes. and uh, if the oil markets go up then uh, all the fossil fuel cars will pay a lot more um, to for fuel, um, so it's a good thing to get away from that. As it is in Hawaii, we we are also you know we don't have any oil here either, and, yeah. and we have to buy our oil from you know Indonesia and the like. Um, so so that's a good thing. Um, it means that the oil, uh, rather the electric car manufacturers, and I want to ask you about that uh, in India will you know will have a a boom. Because they are, because the law requires now that people get off uh, fossil fuel, um, somebody's going to have to produce a lot of electric cars. Now China's trying to get into that market uh, domestically. It has a lot of electric cars and trying to get into the European market. Um, but what about India? Is is yeah. China trying to get electric cars into India, or does India have its own automobile manufacturing facilities uh, that will retool uh, to electric cars? They've, they've already been instructed very strictly to get into the electric uh, uh, vehicles uh, um, sector, like the Tata Motors, uh, you know, you have Volkswagen, all these people are consciously making an effort to change their dependence from uh, oil to uh, electricity. We do have electric cars, but now you see the spending uh, capacity of the Indian man to buy a new car and get rid of his old uh, oil car is going to be a, a factor which is going to hamper this um, bringing it into the normal stream. You know, it is going to take time. But when a person goes to buy a new car, he will think now that I can buy an electric car because they are trying to make it not only uh, oil independent, they have to make it uh, affordable for the Indian masses. The buying capacity, the dependence, the uh, it, it can't be an expensive electric car if it has to succeed in India. You know, one thing I mentioned earlier is the per capita, you know, use of, uh, of fossil fuel uh, in India is actually lower than in other countries. Um, but the, the general rule, and uh, see if you agree with me about this, is that if you provide cheap energy or, you know, ubiquitous cheap energy to a given community, to a given economy, it grows. Successful economies always have cheap and plentiful energy. So if India is able to pull that off, um, to do a lot of renewable energy, energy that's not subject to oil markets, um, energy that comes from solar, what have you, um, and provide more energy for entrepreneurs, for startups in India who are capable of starting new businesses, then productivity in India will increase increase dramatically uh, along with uh, Modi's initiative um, to move into renewables, am I right? Yes, see the current capacity of India uh, uh, to depend on renewable energy is 145 watts. The target set for 2030 was 450 watts. In this summit in the Glasgow, he said that I will increase it to 500 watts, gigawatts, gigawatts. So you see, there has gone from 145 to 500 is almost a tripling of the um, target. So you see what a big difference is going to make. And the new locomotives which are um, which are being manufactured, once they get dep- and I told you the major major dependence of India on coal is through its railways. So once they are modernizing the railway system, you find that the entire system, the entire dependence on, uh, on fossil fuel reduces to a large extent. And it is possible for him to do this because uh, they have actually pinpointed the exact places where they can make a difference. You know, railways, LED, uh, 
cars, uh, uh, cities which are electricity, which are being going to be powered by solar energy is free. They're having grids. They're having solar. Solar energy is tapping into in such a massive way. You even have small temples or houses which are now shifting to solar panels rather than the normal electricity consumption uh, methods. So is, is, is the expectation then that the rooftop solar will be the, the key to this initiative? That is that people will be either uh, expected to spend the money or the government will incentivize or, or maybe both so that the solar we're talking about going forward is on individual rooftops or will it be utility scale solar where the utility you know, does a big solar farm as, as we talked about in the desert in the Northeast? It is, it is being affordable solar energy. You see this, uh, this uh, coalition for disaster infra resilient infrastructure that he has, uh, he has initiated with uh, the UK, Australia, with uh, the small island nations. Uh, Modi's contribution to this, India's contribution to this is that we are providing um, know-how of solar technology to the small island states. So they can, so this same know-how is being implemented in houses of India, but it's a traditional society. It needs time to change. And that time, very rightfully, he has pushed it by a decade, two decades, and it's not wrong because it needs time to uh, enlighten people. You have to now leave dependence on fossil fuel and make sure everything in your house is on renewable energy. Well, it's very interesting is that um, India is not, not only dependent on, on coal right now, and traditionally as a primary source of energy, it's that a lot of people are involved in the coal business. Yes. Um, you know, mining the coal, mining, it's a big mining product, uh, and um, delivering the coal and involved in you know, all the equipment uh, that makes the coal work as providing energy. And so um, I would suspect that it will be painful and it might even have political pushback on it when people realize they're gonna be out of work and their coal companies are gonna to have to fold in favor of you know, clean energy companies. Um, there was a you know, very interesting piece in uh, National Public Radio earlier today about um, this problem for people who have, you know, for generations, because gen oh. coal is an old fuel. <laughs> it's, it's not only old in the ground, it's old in the production. Um, people whose generations behind them have, have been involved in coal for many, many years, they're going to have to give it up. What effect do you think that's going to have, both in terms of their um, e economics, you know, their, their, their ability to earn a living, and also to their political um, pushback? When anything modern comes into traditional, it causes a friction, isn't it? So now when you're going to break in on the indigenous methods of livelihood, there is going to be an outcry. But when you see how they are rehabilitated into other sources of livelihood, or when you see the benefits of, uh, you know, benefits you cannot, you cannot convince anybody it's going to give you a good air because I'm getting my uh, energy from coal. Okay, I'm fine with it. Why do I care about later on? But to ed educate them, to say that, okay, you give up this um, source of livelihood, you get into this hydroelectric uh, uh, car, you, you build these solar panels, you do these things for us, it's going to benefit you in the long term. And coal workers, coal mines, these are people who are, you know, they have cartels. They have huge cartels. To get yeah. rid of these cartels, they have to first target those industries which are dependent on coal. So if you, uh, if you cut the demand for it, the supply automatically stays redundant, doesn't it? Yes. So that's the way he's going for it, that you have to stop manufacturing uh, fossil dependent cars. You have to stop uh, using coal for uh, household purposes. When that reduces, automatically the demand for that will reduce. He cannot target the source, so he's targeting the demand for it. One, one very interesting aspect of his initiative last year was that um, he wanted to develop coal resources in India in order to export coal. 
Um, and uh, the investment was largely directed at uh, mining coal and shipping it off to other places. Now, if he is uh, interested um, in reducing climate change, you know, which is what this is all about, then he's got to stop exporting coal too. So all the revenue that India might have earned um, in the export process will have to stop. Uh, can this, is this going to have a negative effect on the economy? Is this something that uh, India can tolerate? Uh, India, uh, the export of coal of India is not that substantial as other exports, or it's not going to affect the economy as much. Now he has to deliver on what he says, isn't it? He can't make hollow promises like he said, the others make hollow promises. So he has to reduce this, stop this, uh, mitigate it. And uh, uh, he, he, he is going to do this, but this coal export is um, uh, a danger to the entire world, isn't it? Coal burning anywhere, the fumes are going to go and affect somebody in another place. So it's like our pandemic, which we discussed, it's not going to affect only one person. A one person is going to affect everybody. So yeah. he ha you have to understand climate change is, um, um, what is that, omnipresent? <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, ubiquitous. So, uh, you know, in uh, 2009, we started with COP 20, COP 15. Hmm? And, um, and it's been a long time. It's been more than 10 years, some 12 years already. And, um, you know, what, one of the things that people complain about in terms of COP is that you get political rhetoric from uh, national leaders who are going to be out of office very soon. And they can make and they <laughs> and they can make promises uh, which their successors may not be able to deliver. Um, and I, just, I wonder about uh, you know my, my feeling from this discussion is that people generally will follow Modi. They like him. They like him for this. This is this is a good leadership point, not only for the country, not only for India, but for the world. Um, he has distinguished himself here in the last day or so uh, by, you know, by making this assurance. However, how long is he going to be in office, Rupmati? And, uh, is, you know, you are a free society. India is a democratic per, uh, country of, of, of major democratic principles, you know, one of the great democracies in the history of humanity, as a matter of fact. And you have the ability for um, an uneventful transfer of power. The United States may have lost that, but India still has it. <laughs> if, if you win an election, you get the job. So um, my question to you is, uh, how, how bound will Modi's successors be to follow on the promises he made yesterday? Now, now if you see this, in five days, he just left the COP uh, summit. Is it is going on till November 12th? You don't have a single big leader sitting over there. They all left. Uh, so the promises that have to be made have to be delivered by the successors, like you rightly said. So now about Modi being in power, you see it in India in the seven, seven decades that it's existed. We did not have a comprehensive timeline set for us. There was no guideline. And this is a first that we have guidelines that you have to do this, you have to do that, the infrastructure is changing. You know, you have uh, basic amenities reaching uh, a common man. So Modi is not just being uh, elected on a political rhetoric. He's being elected on the development work that he does. There is a lot of flaw in his uh, ideology or whatever you want to say, but you cannot deny the fact that he works for the infrastructure and development of India. That has happened very far and few in between the dynastic politics that took place before this. The, you, when you think for the country, however bad you are, however I, be, I may not agree with you, there is a country that is going to develop because I get basic amenities. And that's what is keeping this uh, government in power. They are developing basic railway stations, bus stations, uh, you know, roads, uh, bridges, you have all this happening everywhere. So it works, it works for the common man. And okay, you're paying more for fossil fuels, everything that works, you know, it hurts. But then what works is more than what hurts. That is the reason why he's elected. Again. <laughs> well, there's, there's another element too I want to explore with you and it's this. So he goes to uh, Glasgow 
and he makes these statements and he is elevated uh, immediately by global media to be a leader in climate change. I don't think there was a newspaper across the world that didn't report his, uh, you know, his, uh, his initiative to get um, off fossil fuels uh, net zero by 2070. I mean, this was global news and he distinguished himself in doing that for sure. And he distinguished India in doing that for sure. And then you take India, which is, you know, uh, 1.234 billion uh, people, and everybody in India knows he did this. Um, I mean, every newspaper, every, every, every media has made it clear to everyone in the country that he did this. And, and I think that not only has he distinguished himself on the global stage of climate change, but also in India. And, and I think I would guess that he has generated a pride, a pride among the Indians that now they are associated with this um, very important uh, global ideal. And they can be, they, the country can be leaders and will be leaders in reaching the goal. Am I right? Do people feel that way, do you think? For sure, for sure, Jay, because you see, the, uh, the uh, Mr. Modi has got leadership qualities, isn't it? Now he has gone on a global stage and he's announced two huge uh, initiatives, which he has initiated himself. The Solar Alliance started in the Paris Agreement five years back. Now it has got more than 100 uh, member states. He's talking of the um, Coalition for Disaster uh, Resilient Infrastructure. Now these two initiatives show that a person can come up and make a difference. And he's saying uh, the point that I liked about his speech was when he said that the countries who do not follow these guidelines, punish them. Can you do this? Can you punish anybody for climate change? But he is saying that you can do this, put, a, put pressure on the countries to follow it. He called on the north-south divide between the developed and the uh, underdeveloping countries and said the developing, developed countries have to contribute close to $1 trillion. So that is a call. And when somebody takes a, a stand like this, such a strong stand on basis of developed countries, talking of small island nations, hobnobbing with the uh, developed uh, countries to build alliances, you see that there's a comprehensive uh, uh, persona that he uh, portrays. And that, that spelled uh, success for India on the world stage. So, and climate change is a, um, is a place where you have a lot of hollow promises. And to see a leader talk of timelines, datelines, practical ones, even if they're later than the normal thing, he spoke practical. And he gave results, what is happening. So that was the difference uh, between uh, leaders who just speak and leaders who act. Yes. That Everyone is asking that, you know, who are the leaders who, who give us rhetoric and who are the leaders that give us action? And um, there's a big distinction in terms of the way the world looks at those leaders. And I suggest to you that he has distinguished himself uh, and in the process distinguished India as a place of action um, on the climate change stage. I will also suggest this, see if you agree with me, that as and when uh, he completes the task or at least gets on the road, you know, it's a long way, it's a long way to completing the task, but it gets on the road and, and does the things that have to be done legally and um, in terms of, um, you know, national development, um, he will change India. He will be a remarkable figure in Indian history. Uh, he will change the country of, in terms of economics, in terms of politics, in terms of self-perception and all uh, perception of, of, of the global place that India occupies. Am I right? Do you feel that too? Absolutely. It was stunning headlines, which showed that India has a leader who can take you on the global stage. And it was not just stunning in the way he, he portrays uh, his ambitions. You can call it ambitions, but those ambitions have got a solid, concrete, uh, practical uh, plan, which is in line. That's why you cannot now, how many uh, leaders represented the countries, but how many stood out? How many could have the same bargaining power with developed countries and the same alliance with non-developed countries? 
so that kind of a two way uh, a two pronged uh, influence that he has is very rare in, uh, and if he succeeds on this climate it's going to benefit everybody you, you must be proud are you proud very proud <laughs> <laughs> You know, I wanted to ask you one more question, Ruth Mati. I, I, we started out um, discussing, um, you know, your latest book, uh, Reforming the United Nations. And in fact, you're intimately familiar with the United Nations working there. And so um, and I guess, um, you know, the question really is, uh, how does what happened that didn't happen, so to speak, at, at, uh, at, it's still not finished, it still has a few days to go, but what is happening at uh, COP26, how does that affect the United Nations? How will it affect the United Nations? No organization in the world should be as concerned with climate change as the United Nations. And there have been many criticisms, I'm sure you covered it in the book, uh, of the United Nations and its ability, its collective will to do something about climate change. Will COP26 affect that? COP26 becomes a milestone for the United Nations, as have all the main summits. You know, it provides just a guideline. But you see the alliances and the bilaterals that take place on the, uh, on the, in the backdrop of the UN are the ones which actually make a difference. Now, this Solar Alliance was formed in the United Nations General Assembly, sidelines with uh, uh, India and the Caribbean, CARICOM and the Pacific nations. It didn't happen on the UN platform. So what the UN is doing is just providing a platform, uh, only sole intergovernmental comprehensive platform for the countries to come and talk. But the effectiveness of policies takes place in the bilaterals and multilaterals that take place on the sidelines of the UN. So that is where now, when you set these, because we do not have a, a mechanism for implementation in the UN, they just say it. But there are no punishments or no, uh, you cannot uh, be uh, penalized for not conforming to the guidelines. That becomes a, a, a picking point for the UN. You just say it, but you don't see that it is done. You know, that, that is the point, that is the drawback of the uh, uh, setback for the UN. Yeah, it it's, it's always it's always been and is subject to these international politics involving strategical moves like like uh, by Russia and China. So you know they sort of pull the rug out from under a legitimate, uh, well-intentioned initiative. Uh, regrettable, but maybe between COVID and climate change and and the and the follow-up on COP twenty six, um, the United Nations will be able to step up a little more. I'm hoping that, I know you're hoping that. Um, and so we, we have to get back together again. Uh, Rupmati, we have to discuss this going forward. This is something to watch. Uh, it is an existential threat. Humanity is at risk. And uh, you and me, we can talk about that. Maybe we can save the world, Rupmati. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. So what message would you leave with our viewers today? It's like, uh, like the same thing that we said for the other uh, discussions that we, we always have comprehensive issues which are so comprehensive. They are, they are global, but affect you on a personal level. So climate change is going to, it's um, not a threat that will affect future generations and our children and this and that. It's ex existential. It is about now. It is how much it's, you know, you can see the uh, adverse effects of climate in every place that we are seeing today. So we have to mitigate and we have to do our little part in um, trying to depend now on renewable sources of energy. Do that bit, it'll work. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope. We are all together now, like it or not. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Rupmati. Rupmati Kandakar, uh, out of New York today. Uh, we so enjoyed talking with you, and we hope to do it again soon. Always a pleasure, Jay. Always. So Aloha much. and Aloha. namaste. Aloha.